Kelly Ashamala, who will be talking about CRP and critically ill patients and the value or lack thereof. All right, so today we're going to be asking the question of whether CRP is crappy and crumpy patients um, or whether CRP, uh, routine measurement, is useful at admission to medical intensive care units. So CRP is a protein that was first described in 1930 by these two gentlemen. Um, it was first actually discovered as a reaction to one of the polysaccharide components of the pneumococcus. Um, it wasn't until about 17 years later that it was described as an acute phase reactant. Um, so CRP is a, it's a pentameric protein. It's synthesized by the liver, and it's, uh, it's synthesized in response to IL-6, uh, which is created by macrophages and T cells. Um, it uh, binds LPS on dead or dying cells, plays a role in complement activation, also has a lot of other roles, uh, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, pro-coagulant, um, nitric oxide, um, you name it. So essentially what happens is that IL-6 starts to appear about an hour after the onset of infection. Hepatic synthesis of CRP starts at about six to eight hours and then peaks somewhere between 36 to 50 hours after this whole process starts has a relatively short half-life, and it's cleared by the liver. Um, and you will probably all recognize this acute phase reactance chart, so it's a positive acute phase reactance. As you can see, it's the big peak there. So it's been described, and it's most useful to us in terms of chronic infection. So things like acute rheumatic fever, osteomyelitis, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Okay. Um, since, since its uh, discovery, it's also been described in um, ischemic stroke, cardiovascular disease, um, even things like depression and disordered sleep. Uh, it's a reaction to inflammatory states. So uh, it's elevated in conditions like cardiovascular disease, stroke, advanced cancer, crystal induced disease, um, surgery, burns, and tissue necrosis. So not just in infection. Um, but it's not, surprisingly, it's not actually elevated in all the inflammatory states you might expect it to be. So the mixed con connective tissue disorders, um, ulcerative colitis, leukemia, graft versus host disease. So how do we use CRP, you know, knowing what it's, when it's elevated, when it's not elevated? So in order to kind of discern our ordering habits, we did a study of 30 item residents. There they are. You may recognize some of them. Um, to assess how we order CRP at admission to the hospital. So, <laughs> this is a fairly contentious issue in our residency program because we have two sets of uh, attendings who feel very differently and very strongly about the utility of CRP. Um, Dr. Fried, of course, on, the, on my right and your left there, um, doesn't actually really like using CRP in our ICU admissions, and in fact, you may notice that a lot of times the ED doesn't order one, that's because he specifically built it out of the order set. Whereas our wards attendings, um, Dr. Bookspan would be up there, but I could not find his headshot on Google Image Search. <laughs> um, they tend to like us to use CRP better and don't put as much stock in other um, inflammatory biomarkers such as procalcitonin. What's interesting is that our ordering habits kind of run counter to our knowledge of how our attendings like us to order CRP. So um, if you see here, in people that are admitted to the hospital generally, we tend to order in about, let's say, 50 to 99%. You see nobody has answered that they order CRP in all of the patients that we admit, which is, I mean, not necessarily inappropriate. However, in critically ill pe people that are admitted to the med medical ICU, <laughs> you can see that we are skewed far more towards ordering than not ordering, um, which is interesting. So that leads us to the, the big question of whether routine measurement is actually useful at admission to the ICU. So as a tool to diagnose infection, um, this study, a French study in a, in a ICU bed looked at CRP and its correlation with proven infection. Um, so they compared CRP alone, temperature, white cell count, um, and SIRS to the combination of meeting SIRS criteria and uh, an elevated CRP. And they found that actually the combination of SIRS and CRP does, did more reliably diagnose sepsis than other parameters, but both had good sensitivity and poor specificity when measured alone. Um, however, as a predictor of mortality, um, this is a Finnish study that showed that baseline CRP failed to predict patient survival um, on admission to ICU. 
Uh, they had, this is uh, specifically patients with spe suspected sepsis due to pneumonia, meningitis, uh, peritonitis, mediastinitis, and one case of malaria. I don't know how they got to Finland. Um, but they found that the Apache at admission was a much better predictor of mortality. They didn't comment on the correlation of CRP with Apache score, um, but the baseline CRP at admission, um, the mean CRP at admission was 164, and that was the same in patients with later proved sepsis um, and not. Uh, similarly, in this Belgian study, uh, CRP failed to predict patient survival. This study actually excluded any patients that had had recent major surgery or were in any kind of immunocompromised state. Um, and again, the mean CRP at admission was elevated. Um, this Spanish study found the area under the curve for CRP as a predictor of mortality to be 0.5 exactly, which means that it was worthless. Um, they found that the Apache score and the SOFA score were better predict uh, predictors of mortality, and they did include immunosuppressed patients. 18.2% of the people included in this trial were in some state of immunocompromise, and actually CRP uh, was not significantly different for those patients than it was for patients without immunocompromise. Um, as a marker of organ failure, on the other hand, CRP did um, prove to be useful in this study. So the, the ones that we just spoke about were patients with suspected sepsis. This is a study of all comers to a Belgian ICU, and they did find that admission CRP was significantly higher um, in patients with organ failure. You can see this chart at the bottom here. Those little um, emptier bars are the admission CRP, and you can see that with the number of organ systems that are failing, the CRP does go up. Um, and so it was correlated with, with what's called the SOFA score. Uh, the SOFA score is a, is a measure of sequential organ failure. So it takes into account things like um, coagulation, renal failure, um, liver failure, et cetera. And it does so by using parameters that we look at anyway. So for the respiratory system, we're looking at P to F ratio. Um, for cardiovascular system, we're looking at presence of hypotension, degree of hypotension, and number of pressors needed. Um, for renal, we're looking at creatinine, for CNS, Glasgow coma sale, scale, et cetera. So we're measuring all these parameters anyway. We know the CRP correlates with them, but it's not necessarily telling us anything that we didn't know from the other things we were doing. Um, in multiple trauma patients, uh, there was no correlation of CRP with mortality or actually later development of sepsis. Um, there was one study that showed that septic trauma patients had actually lower CRP than uh, septic non-trauma patients, but that was uh, measurements that were taken at the onset of SIRS and not actually at admission, so it doesn't really fit our question. Not to mention that CRP is elevated in patients with cardiogenic shock, pancreatitis, in the post operative state, patients with injuries, and patients with burns. So a lot of these describe patients that are maybe seen in the surgical ICU, not so much on our side of things. Um, however, in patients with liver disease, you may recognize this gentleman here on this slide. Um, CRP at admission to ICU uh, is similar in critically ill patients with and without liver cirrhosis, which is counterintuitive because we know CRP is synthesized and cleared by the liver, um, so you think that that would have a confounding effect. But in all the studies that showed this, that I could find at least, the uh, cirrhosis was associated with higher mortality rate, greater rate of disease severity, and uh, more organ dysfunction. In patients with fulminant liver failure, um, many had normal CRP despite proven sepsis, and actually elevated CRP was a better marker of degree of hepatic failure than degree of infection. In renal patients, clinically stable hemodialysis patients often have elevated CRP above normal, um, especially just after dialysis. And there's a lot of proposed mechanisms for this, including um, in low volume uh, filtration, either back filtration with bacterial contaminants, gut translocation, or actually a reaction to some of the filters or the components of the filters that are used in the dialysis machine itself. In cardiovascular disease, CRP is elevated in patients with unstable angina, acute MI, um, and high cardiovascular risk scores. The reason you see a chicken and an egg here is because we're not really sure which comes first. Higher uh, rate of inflammation is more correlated with all these diseases, so um, uncertain whether more inflammation leads to greater disease or if greater disease leads to more inflammation.
Um, and then on top of that, uh, in several of the, pa the papers that I read, they mentioned this, which is that there's significant differences in mean CRP levels between patients with alcohol, alcoholism, smoking, preceding antibiotic treatment as baseline characteristics, char sorry, characteristics versus those who didn't have any of those. Um, so basically, we've covered the entirety of patients that get admitted to resident teams, um, including those that go to the ICU. As opposed to routine measurement of initial CRP at admission, measuring CRP after 48 to 96 hours is shown to be significantly correlated with severity of illness. Um, even more than a 48-hour time mark elevation of CRP, the change from the 48-hour mark to the 96-hour mark is an even better indicator of clinical course. And so you see this is the third question on our survey, which shows that the majority of residents did find that trending CRP in their critically ill patients does help them make decisions. Some of them actually felt very enthusiastic <laughs> about this. <laughs> Um, and then just I wanted to mention very briefly, in patients that are not admitted to the ICU, actually, admission CRP is correlated with disease severity in patients with pneumonia based on their pneumonia severity index. So patients in class 3 or class 4 have much higher CRP than those in class 1 and class 2. And that's one of the markers that we use to decide whether we're going to treat with steroids or not. In patients who are admitted to wards, the CRP was actually a good predictor of whether or not they would later require transfer to the ICU, and that was true in patients with pneumonia and also in one study in patients with H1N1 infection. So there is a definite role for CRP measurement in non-critically ill patients that we are admitting to our services. So. To wrap this all up, I wanted to use, um, this is actually a paper that Dr. Freed sent me. These are the 10 commandments of evaluation of biomarker research. I only included four here because I thought they were the most relevant to our discussion. So first, clinical context can change the utility of a biomarker. So for example, when we talked about CRP in relation to organ dysfunction, um, we did find that CRP was elevated, but that in the clinical context, it wasn't necessarily contributing anything to our understanding of the severity of disease. Timing of the test is pivotal interpreting results. Um, so <coughs> admission CRP, not necessarily useful to us, but 48 hour, 96 hour, and the difference between the two can have a really big impact on our understanding of patient's clinical course. The ideal biomarker should be able to change the management of the patient. So in admission CRP, when there are so many confounders such as other diseases, renal patients, liver patients, smoking patients, alcoholic patients, what have you, um, it doesn't necessarily give us information that we can use to change our initial management. And finally, justifying the cost of measuring a biomarker. And the cost of measuring a CRP to the patient is $112 every time we do it. So you decide whether you think that that's worth it. Here are many, many references so that you know that I didn't make all this up. And does anyone have any questions? So when we're, when you said earlier we're measuring the CRP at hour 40 or 96, mm -hmm. is that in comparison to an admission CRP or just alone looking at how alone looking at where it is after a couple of days so not necessarily the change from the zero hour to the 48 hour mark but the change from the 48 hour to the 96 hour mark I have some question. did they mention how long these patients are sick because you know if they started their infection or their process yeah. a week ago and we're measuring you know, a week later or whatever, does that have anything to do with that? They didn't actually do that. Um, this is all looking at, you know, patient rolls in the door, their measurement in the ICU. Where I suspect that that made a difference is the patient with multi-organ failure, how they have elevated CRP and that it is related to the degree of severity. Probably those patients have been ill for longer, which is confounding, you know, our time to onset versus our time of admission. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. By using it as an outpatient. I have patients that come in the office and sometimes mm -hmm. they, well, they've had abdominal pain and went away. I can't mm -hmm. tell if they're sick or not sick. Yeah. I, uh, sometimes when, when you're on the fence, it can be really helpful. I get that and the sed rate. And actually, I'm surprised to see how discrepant they are sometimes. Yeah. I had a guy that was, had abdominal pain, went away over three days. I examined him, there was absolutely nothing there. I got a, I got a CRP, it was 100. Yeah. So I then got a CT scan on him and he had diverticulitis. So I think in, in, in an outpatient setting, it may work differently. Absolutely, and even I mean, and even in wards admissions, I think that it can be useful, but or that it is useful actually. But the 
um, patient that is critically ill enough to come in and immediately be admitted to the ICU, it doesn't necessarily have the same clinical utility. Dr. Fitzgibbons. And so I think from an infection perspective, from my, from my perspective, what you've kind of shown is a lot of data to support the fact that the CRP correlates with all of these not very subtle metrics that already tell us the patient's very sick. And I think Dr. Rogers' point is exactly how we tend to use it as an outpatient, which is we're looking for the most subtle abnormalities that we can't pick up that aren't in our face, that the patient doesn't have a PSI or the scores that you know correlate with real illness. Mm -hmm. And I think that it does the trend often does have utility in that in that different setting, which is a, is a different question. Yeah. I don't I don't think a CRP for me makes a difference which is when we go the ICU are admitted are to the floor are even admitted to the hospital, I think. There are other more telltale vital signs uh, that are important. I like CRPs primarily for people with chronic infections to, to monitor the course, but that doesn't make any difference about how long uh, we're in the ICU or not. So I, I'm, I'm a real believer in that particular aspect. Of it. So I guess uh, the next question, is it a myth? Uh, routine measurement of CRP is useful in critically ill patients. So again, routine, meaning most or all patients should get it, just like a chem panel or a CBC. Um, and um, in critically ill patients specifically, not, we're not talking about outpatients, we're not talking about people who have been discharged from the hospital that you're following. It's time to vote, guys. You've been here before. We've been through this. So how many think that this myth is confirmed, meaning it's it's actually true, it's not a myth. How many think it's plausible? How many think it's busted? All right.